Hello, Algebra 2 local students. This is probability day four. It is actually the last new day of probability before we get into some review at the end of this week. So <clears throat> today we're going to take a look at something called independent and compound events. A compound event, maybe you can figure it out based on the way it's phrased, is just kind of doing in uh, more than one event. Okay, so up until this point, we've really only done single events where we draw one card from a deck, we roll the die once, we toss a coin once. Now we might do something more than once. We might pick two cards from the deck. We might roll the die twice. Okay, so that's kind of what's coming up today. As a quick review, there's two questions that I'd encourage you to try at the start of today's note. So the first one is, if you choose one card from a standard deck, what is the probability that you'll choose a five or an even number? And that keyword or, or will always for you mean to add the probabilities together. So there are four fives in the deck out of 52. There are 20 even cards, and that probably was a little bit tougher. So the ones that I'm counting as even are two, four, six, eight, and 10. And there's four of each of those. So since there's five even numbers times four, that's 20 cards out of the 52. So adding those together gets you the probability 24 out of 52. Now remember for an or question, if there's any overlap between these two groups, if there was a card that was both five and even at the same time, you would subtract that out. But there is no overlap between those two groups okay so you purely just add those two things together then in the next question you're looking at the word ridiculous and what is the probability that it is a vowel that we choose randomly and after the letter m in the alphabet when you see the word and this is that overlap that i was talking about up here what do these two groups have in common so i kind of just listed them out i said okay here are the vowels that are in that word here are the letters that come after the letter m and they have the o and both u's in common so there are three in common out of a total of 10 letters in the word ridiculous, that would be vowels and come after the letter M. So just a quick reminder as to what or versus and looks like. We're gonna jump right into today's lesson then, which at the top it says something about independent events and it says events are independent when the result of one event in no way influences the results of another. And the best way I think to kind of think about this is tossing a coin. When you toss a coin, whether you get heads or tails the first time will not affect what happens when you toss it a second time or a third time, okay? That, that third time I go to pick up the coin, the chances of getting heads or tails are still the same as it was for the first two tosses. So to find the probability that I get a tail each time when I toss a coin a total of three times, we're gonna approach this by making a tree diagram. So a tree diagram might look something like this where we're gonna to toss the coin, and when I toss the coin, I can get heads or I can get tails. If I got heads the first time, remember, since these are independent, the next time I can get heads or tails. Similarly over here, if I got tails the first time, next toss, I can get heads or I can get tails. And then finally, this is the second toss, right? So the third toss from each of these, you're gonna have heads or tails branching off for that third toss. And when I look down to the bottom row here, this is the total number of outcomes that are possible when tossing a coin three times. So there winds up being eight outcomes total. And when I see that there are eight outcomes total, what I want you to look at <clears throat> is just the outcome, now I kind of gave it away when I said the outcome, of getting a tail each time, because there's only one case where you're gonna get a tail, a tail, and a tail. And it happens to be this last branch of the tree diagram. No other branch would have tail, tail, tail other than that one. So since this is the only path I can take to get tail, 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 the probability that you get tails each time is going to be one out of eight. Okay. So here's my probability of getting tails, tails, tails. And the question is, how could I have determined that without making a tree diagram? Because let me phrase it to you this way. What if I wanted to get um, toss the coin 10 times and get tail, 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 10 times? Do I want to make a tree diagram that branches all the way to 10 tosses? Probably not. So what I want you to think about is what is the probability of getting a tails at each step along the way? Now, remember, since these events are independent, the probability of getting tails on the first toss is one half. The probability of getting tails on toss two, still a half. And then the probability of tails on the third toss is one half again. 
So if the probability at each stage along the way, at each toss, is that I'm getting one half, what can I do with those three probabilities to come up with an answer of one eighth? And I'm hoping what you might be noticing is that if you multiply all the tops and then multiply all the bottoms, one times one times one is one still, and two times two times two is eight. So it turns out that when events are independent, you can actually multiply the probability of each event occurring, and that will get you your total probability. So rather than making a tree diagram, even though this wasn't too taxing for us to do, like I said, the more tosses we include here, you know, the more outcomes we're gonna get and the lengthier that process becomes. So it can be accomplished as simply as taking the probability of each event and then multiplying it together. Now, it didn't have to be that we were getting tails each time, so let's go ahead and take a look at this for rolling a die, because that's another classic example of something we've looked at with probability. And that's what exactly it says here. You know, since no toss affects each, we're going to multiply the probabilities of independent events. So when I roll a die, whatever happens on the first roll would not affect what happens on the second roll. So it says roll a die three times. So what's the probability of getting even on all three? So this is the probability of getting an even, an even and then another even, okay? No matter what happened the first time, will not affect the second, will not affect the third. So what is the probability of getting an even number when rolling a die? Remember the numbers on the die are one through six, and hopefully you're recalling that half of those numbers are even. Now, even though I'm saying a half, I feel like with dice questions, I have kind of stuck with denominators of six, since there's six possible outcomes. So three out of the six are even, when I roll it again, if I want even, doesn't matter what happened the first time. Probability of getting even again is three out of six. And the last time you're still gonna have a three out of six chance of that happening. So if you multiply across the top, three times three times three is 27. And you can use a calculator because you're gonna get some actually some larger numbers today as compared to some of the other days of notes. Six times six times six is 216. And this is the final answer I'll list. But Again, for some of you sitting out there saying, wait, isn't it just the same thing as saying a half times a half times a half, which we just saw in this case was one eighth? Yeah, I mean, this would reduce to one eighth. So I will not require you to reduce any of these fractions if you want to leave it in that format. But let's see if I can turn on this light here to make this better. If you type in 27 over 216 on the calculator and then hit math frac, it will reduce it to the fraction one over eight. So if you're want to take that extra step, go for it. Otherwise, you can just multiply across the tops and across the bottoms on your calculator. All right, the next one, what's the probability that when you roll the die, the first time you get a four, second time a prime, and then the third time a number less than three. So there's three distinct things happening here. You're just gonna multiply those probabilities together. First time getting a four is one out of six. Second time getting a prime, remember the primes are two, three, five, so that's three out of six. Last time, a number less than three. The only numbers less than three are the one and the two, so that's two out of six. The nice thing about the six times six times six is we already know that, that the denominator is 216. And if I multiply across the top, one times three times two is a total of six. Okay, so final answer for part B, six out of 216 chance that that will happen. All right, moving on to the next page. I will tell you that at the top of the next page, we have a spinner that is really tough to see. I really wish it could print in color here, but hopefully you can read this, guys. This says red, orange, purple, yellow is pretty clear. This is green, okay? So the question says, spin the spinner twice. Okay, so spinning it once. Whatever I do the second time, I spin it again. Doesn't matter what happened the first time. What's the probability that you get orange both times? It doesn't say anything about if it's more likely to get one color than another. I'm gonna assume an equal probability of landing in any of these spaces. So the probability of getting an orange is one out of five. If I spin it again, what's the probability I get orange a second time? One out of five. So multiply across the top and then across the bottom to get a final answer of 1 25th, one out of 25. What's the probability of never getting a green? And remember, we are still spinning it twice, okay? So the probability I never get green. Well, on the first try, if I don't wanna get green, that means it can land in any of the other four spaces. So we're gonna say not getting a green on the first spin is four out of five. And since spinning the spinner is independent, 
probability of not getting green the second time is also four out of five. Multiply the tops, multiply the bottoms. Definitely more likely that that will happen than getting orange both times. Okay, 16 out of 25 chance that you'll never get a green. Okay, moving on to what are called compound events. Compound events, it says, is an event that consists of two or more independent events. So we might be rolling a pair of dice. We might be tossing a coin three times, which we've kind of already talked about. But we can also combine those ideas. So if you look at number one, it says a die is rolled and a coin is tossed. I'm hoping you would think that whatever happens on the die would not affect at all what happens on the coin. So since those events are independent, this compound event, we can still multiply those probabilities together. What is the probability that you'll get an even number on the die and a head on the coin? Okay, so two very distinct things, but I'm just gonna multiply those probabilities together. Getting an even number on the die is going to be a three out of six chance. Okay, getting heads on the coin, coins are pretty easy, it's a 50-50 chance, right? So one out of two. Multiply across the top and across the bottom to get three out of 12. And some of these probabilities will be easy enough for you to multiply, but you know, don't be afraid to use a calculator if needed. All right, next one, we're rolling a pair of dice. Find the probability that you get an even on one and a prime on the other. Even we just did on the dice, even is three out of six. Prime we've also, I feel like, done a lot. That's also three out of six. We gotta be pretty uh, confident with that fact, or at least recalling which of the numbers on the die are prime. So three times three is nine, six times six is 36. Okay. What's the probability that I get a number less than four? And then I get a number greater than four. Okay, so a number less than four, that would be the one to the two or the three. So there's three out of six there. A number greater than four would just be the five or the six. So there's only two out of six options there for a total probability of six out of 36. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. If we look at the next example, we're going back to that color spinner from the top. Okay, so the same colored sections as what we saw up at the top. And then we've seen this spinner a few times in other days of notes as well. You got black and white spaces and the numbers one through eight. I would encourage you to hit pause for one sec here and you're spinning each spinner once. We want the probability that you get orange and then odd, and then here green and a number greater than or equal to six. Go ahead, hit pause, try that real quick, and then see if you can check with my answers. First one, probability of orange and then odd. So orange is a one out of five chance of happening. An odd number on this wheel, there are four out of eight that are odd. So if I multiply across the top and across the bottom, that becomes four out of 40, final answer. Okay, and then the second case was probability of green. Green is still one out of five. And then a number greater than or equal to six. Just be careful and really make sure you're, you're confident with what that symbol means. Greater than or equal to six could be six, seven, and eight. Usually it just says greater than six, what we've seen in a lot of the questions. But if it could be equal to six, we can include that. So there are three numbers out of eight on the spinner for a total answer of three out of 40. All right, hopefully this isn't so bad for you as we're kind of working through some independent and compound events. The last main idea for today is the concept of replacement. So the concept of replacement is if something is with replacement, that means that when you choose an object, let's say it's choosing a card from a deck of cards, that's one of the most common things we'll do, that you look at it and then you return it to the deck of cards to make your next selection. Whereas if you're looking at something without replacement, that means if I pick a card from the deck, that I do not return it before the next event happens. So now these events are not independent, they become dependent events. So that becomes a little bit tough because if I take a card and I don't replace it, the second time I go to pick a card from the deck, you now only have 51 to choose from, not 52 anymore. So it's the difference between, do I still have 52 cards in the deck because I replaced the first one? Or if I didn't replace, now we're only down to 51 to choose from. So we're gonna consider that as we go through the next couple of examples. Number one, we're looking at with replacement. Two cards with replacement. So we're putting it back in the deck. All right, find the probability that you get an ace and then a black jack. Okay, ace is in the deck, there are four of them. 
And then the next one is a black jack. Okay, so black jacks, there are two of them. It's the, the jack of clubs and the jack of spades. Since I replaced the first card, when I go to pick one of those two black jacks, there are still 52 cards to choose from. I'm certainly not expecting, you know, 52 times 52. But 4 times 2, that's easy enough. That's 8. I'll tell you, 52 times 52, because of maybe the work that we do often with cards here, this will be a common number that you'll see come up in probabilities. It's 2704, 2704. Okay, so that's the answer to the first one here. The probability that I pick a king and a king. All right, first time I reach in and I want to go to pick a king, the chances of doing that is 4 out of 52. There's 4 kings in the deck. Now remember, I replaced that king. It's with replacement. So the second time I go in, if I want to pick a king, it's still a four out of 52 chance. These events are independent. Doesn't matter what happened the first time. So the final probability here would be 16 on top. 52 times 52 we just saw is 2704. I say we skip the prime number one. Okay, let's actually move on to talk about what's happening without replacement. So when I pick that first card, because we're still picking two cards, I'm not putting it back in the deck. Let's see how some of these um, answers change. And we're going to, we'll skip C again. Probably a picking an ace and then a black jack. So the ace was four out of 52. When I go to pick a black jack, there are still two black jacks in the deck. But there's only 51 cards to choose from, because I already chose one card and I did not put it back in the deck. It's without replacement. So the numerator is 8, but the new denominator, 52 times 51, which may also be a common number that comes up, is 2,652. So on the bottom, 2,652, and there's the answer, okay? Probability of getting a king and a king, same example as up here, but it's not the same probability if it's without replacement. First time I reach in, chances of picking in a king are 4 out of 52. But if I choose a king on that first draw from the deck, the second time I go to pick a king, there's now only three left out of 51 cards. Okay, so if I choose a king the first time, there is four out of 52. Second time, there's only three kings left out of 51 cards. So the total up top is 12, and the denominator is this 2,000. 652. It takes definitely a little while to get used to the terms with and without replacement, but when you see it come up on the homework, refer to these examples. See if they can help you to make some sense of it. Next one, we're going to be choosing some marbles, okay, from a jar. If two marbles are chosen without replacement, so there's that keyword, I'm not putting it back in. What is the probability that I get a blue marble and then a red marble? Okay. Reach in and get a blue marble. The chances of that happening are one out of six. Now, since I'm not replacing that marble, the second time I go to reach in to get a red marble, there's still two red in there, but there's only five marbles left to choose from because I did not replace the first. So the probability of this happening would be two out of 30. <clears throat> probability of picking blue and then blue again. This one's gonna be weird because what, Watch what happens. Probability of blue the first time we know is one out of six. But remember, there's only one blue marble. So if I don't replace the blue marble, the probability of picking blue again is now zero out of five. There's no blue marbles left and there's only five to choose from. So when you multiply the top, you get zero out of 30 is the probability, which essentially means that there is no chance I can do this. And I hope that makes sense to you that if you choose the blue marble the first time, there's not a chance you can choose that second marble. If this question was with replacement, it would have been possible. Probably picking the blue again would have also been one out of six. So this keyword with and without makes a big difference. And then in the last example, we're gonna look at the letters in the word mathematics. And we're gonna do the same question both without and with replacement. So in the word mathematics, there are I believe 11 letters. Let me double check that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah, there's 11 letters total. And we're looking at the probability of picking three vowels. So the vowels, how many are there? One, two, three, four. Double check that. And we got A, E, A, I. So there are four vowels total. 
Okay. If we want to look at this first without replacement, that means when I pick a vowel randomly from the letters there, I don't put it back in the list. So the probability of picking the first vowel is going to be 4 out of 11. The probability that I pick another vowel is now only 3 out of 10. There's three vowels left out of the 10 letters because I didn't replace the first letter. I'm not replacing that one, so now the third vowel is 2 out of 9. So you'll see questions look like uh, this, where the numerator and denominator each decrease by 1 each time if you're trying to choose the same thing each time. 4 times 3 times 2, I got that. That's 24, but... 11 times 10 times 9 sounds like 990 to me. So we've got 24 on top over 990. Okay. Well, let's look at how different it looks like when it's with replacement. So with replacement means first time I go to choose a vowel, it's 4 out of 11. But since I put that vowel back in the mix, second time I choose a vowel, still 4 out of 11. Third time, still 4 out of 11. So 4 times 4 times 4 up top is... 64, 11 cubed, I'm not as familiar with, but 11 times 11 times 11 is 1331. And that's the final answer there. So the next thing that you'll see is probability homework four that you'll complete. And then finally, after that, you're just gonna have to try and really piece this all together by looking at some questions on a review sheet later this week. So if you have any questions, let us know. And we'll be talking to you guys soon.